So um, as our opening keynote, we have the great pleasure to welcome Amanda Brock. I apologize to you, Amanda, that I won't be able to list all of your amazing achievements at this point, but let me just share with the audience that Amanda is an award-winning lawyer that has been active for over two decades. She has been chairing or is chairing and contributing to a host of important open source initiatives in the UK and in Europe. And today, of course, she is the CEO of Open UK, the UK-based not-for-profit that has been active um, in supporting open source collaboration and open technologies since 2019. In her keynote, Amanda will provide us with an overview of the global public sector and the open source landscape. She will ask us why do governments want open source? How successful has the public been in implementing these technologies? And um, more, much more, I think. So I suspect this will give us an excellent overview of the, and the starting point for this journey that we are on today. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us here in Bern today, Amanda. We are looking forward to your input. Thank you very much and good morning to you all. Um, I'm Amanda Brock, I'm CEO of Open UK. I started my journey into open source, has someone got the clicker, there we go. Um, I started my journey into open source back in 2008, 16 years ago. And I'd been a lawyer then for 15 years, mostly working in companies, and I joined the company Canonical. And I was general counsel there, I ran the legal team for five years. And uh, I probably shouldn't walk behind these, should I? That's going to take me off camera. Um, Canonical at that time was the leading open source company in Europe, and it's the commercial sponsor of the Ubuntu operating system. And I spent five years being completely immersed in open source software day in, day out. And leaving there, I've done a number of different roles over the last uh, 10, 15 years. Those roles have always involved engagement with open source communities. And my engagement is generally around governance. I've chaired a number of advisory boards or sat on them. This is one of my favorites for the UN. I have some government appointments into things like the UK's Open Standards Board. And increasingly, I find myself on lists in the UK of the top 100 leaders or influencers in UK tech. And that's a little bit about me, but it's mostly about the shift that we've seen in open source and open technologies and the importance that we, we see it take today. Uh, one of the, the hardest things I've ever done was edit this book. And I, I have a copy with me. It's about this thick. It's 640 pages. It's not bed. Well, maybe it is bedtime reading. And it's available open access. So this QR code will take you through to the open access and it has a very good index because I don't expect anybody else to read all 640 pages. And it was written by 26 different authors around the world who are the global leaders in open source with their different specializations. And when we launched it in America two years ago, it went viral on the Chinese internet which shows you some level of engagement of open source globally, but particularly in China and Asia and some of our emerging countries on the global south. And what's happened as a consequence of that is a community in China of almost 30 people have translated the book into Mandarin and it will be published in October in Mandarin. And part of my role means that I travel the world. I travel the world doing this, talking to people about open source. And I'm gonna to talk to you for just about 25 minutes, and then we should have five minutes for questions. But I'll also leave you with my contact details so that you can follow up with me afterwards. Am I speaking too fast? No? Okay, good. So wave if you can't hear me or you want me to slow down. So Open UK is a very innovative organization. It broke the mold in country organizations. We focus geographically, we bring people together, but then we collaborate globally. We focus on people, we don't focus on companies, because if you're outside of the US or China, you'll find many of the people in your country working in open source are not employed locally. They don't work for your local tech sector. 
And we also focused on open technology, so software, hardware, data, which of course encompasses AI and standards. And we did that because when you look at software today, you cannot think about it alone. Now, all of these people are part of Open UK, but we have three members of staff. And I think we're the biggest and most successful grouping of open source people, open source project, which doesn't have code as an output. And we work on three pillars, community, bringing these people together. And we, we bring them together through recognition programs like awards, through recognition programs like our British honours system, and we have our own honours list for them. And we use that collective, that community, to have a voice. We give it a voice, and that voice can have influence on law and policy. We have a great group of lawyers who respond to legislation to help to make sure that the UK's legislation is good for open but also we lead on policy. At COP26, we delivered our first blueprint, bringing together software, hardware, data in a data center environment and showing how you could save carbon emissions by up to 70% by opening up data centers. Since then, we've done a second on EV charging. These are ongoing collaborative projects. In 2021, we started to report about open source in the UK. And for those of you in the public sector, you might find the case studies and the research that we've done in these reports. It's all Creative Commons, help yourself, but you might find that useful as a starting point. This year, as we go into an election in the UK, we have a manifesto that we're leading, an open manifesto for all parties. And we're asking for three things. As we think about open source, we need to see better curation, better understanding on the part of the user as to how to use open source. And we're asking government to build skills in open source as part of the future of our tech sector. We're asking them to enhance the utilization of open source in the public sector, something we'll talk more about this morning, and to enable AI openness. Then we have our third pillar, community, legal and policy and learning, building those skills. And we do that with young people through things like our kids camp, again, all available on our website, Creative Commons, and training for adults. We have run two conferences and we're about to run our third next February. These are amongst the most diverse conferences in technology. We bring together a community that is unprecedented. And all of you are very welcome to join us in February in London if you're, you're able to, to come over. We have quite a lot of focus in that in the public sector. And what we really do is we focus on creating a sense of belonging, something that is for all of us, that enables us to open up technology. So in setting the scene for your conference today, I want to go back to basics. I want to think about your digital economy, our digital economy, and open source. So what is open source? Well, 16 years ago, when I joined Canonical, I would have given you a lawyer's answer. Open source is where the source code is freely available, it's shared, and it's on an open source approved license. And that open source approved license meets the open source definition. Now, if I thought this was a room of open source experts, I would say to you jokingly, let's say that together, let's repeat it together. And I know that nobody in the room could. Even the person who wrote it can't recite it. So I focus on five and six. And if you look at five and six, what you'll see is no discrimination amongst people. That means anybody can use it. And six, no discrimination on field of endeavor, i.e. they can use it for any purpose. Now, of course, there are laws that trump the license. The license is secondary to the law, and the law may restrict who can use or how they can use it with things like export control. But the license itself must never do that. If it does, it can no longer be open source. And confusion around that is one of the biggest issues we have in open source. I look at open source as three generations. So this year, we see Linux 30-year-old, the old man of open source, Gen 1 those who made a conscious decision to move to open source software. Gen 2 may even not know that they're using open source, and they came around Kubernetes 10 years ago. Kubernetes celebrates its 10th birthday on the 6th of June. And Gen 3, the absolute newbies, working on AI, all of which is built on open source. So 16 years ago, with my lawyer's definition, I joined Canonical, and it was tough. It was really tough. We were knocking on doors and trying to get people to adopt open source, and it wasn't happening. And it wasn't happening because it was blocked. 
And it was blocked by people like me, lawyers, procurement professionals, finance people, the risk professionals. And they were blocking open source because we needed contracts. We needed contracts where money changed hands and we needed their approval, and they didn't understand it. They didn't understand the risk. Things have changed, and they've changed for a number of reasons. The first one is digitalization. We've seen a shift. We've seen a shift in the last 10 years, the last three to five in particular, where everything is now digitally delivered, whether that's your enterprise or your public sector services and software. So the software base for that today is open source. And that shift happened to open source, where today, according to 2023 uh, Sonotype survey, the industry standard, 96% of software stacks have open source dependencies. Now, what that means is they're either open source or they need it to run. 76% of that code is open source. And that's changed because the developer role has changed, the engineer role has changed due to digitalization. Suddenly, they have a position of authority. Suddenly, they're a decision maker. But also, they're able to simply access the code, go back to that license. They're able to use one of the 80 plus standard licenses to take code from GitHub, GitLab or equivalent dispersed working tools which enable the easy distribution of open source. So those developers now have some power and they're able just to bring this code into their organizations without going through legal finance or procurement. And what that means is risk has shifted. If you try to manage risk at the contract level, it's not going to work anymore. It has to be managed at a policy level and it needs to be backed by processes that engineers will follow. Now, Microsoft. Microsoft is maybe not a, a company you expect somebody in open source to talk about. Uh, when I first joined Canonical, the destruction of Microsoft was our, one of our primary goals. And that, um, that shift has happened where we've gone from Steve Ballmer 20 years ago describing Microsoft as a cancer to 2018, 10 years later, where my friend Steve Wally, who works on the open source team, did a keynote a bit like this, but in Edinburgh. And he had this slide of Satya Nadala behind him asking for forgiveness, asking not to be judged on that Steve Ballmer past, but to be judged on today in the future. Because today, Microsoft is the biggest single contributor in the world to open source software. And Steve explains that journey that Microsoft has been on. And he explains it for three reasons. Firstly, Anybody who has learned to code in the last 20 years will use open source methodologies. We're now in a competitive market because of digitalization. It's hard to get good developers and engineers and they command big salaries. To be able to hire them, you have to allow them to do open source. Microsoft's second reason for open source is a lot of the best innovation is open source and their customers are coming to them and naming the software they want them to use and it's open source. And then thirdly, Microsoft have a cloud business, Azure, you've probably heard of it. If you want to run a cloud business, you have to be able to do open source because you're using open source, the whole public cloud is built on open source. And to be part of the open source community, to curate or manage your open source well, you can't just be a user, you have to engage, you have to collaborate, you have to contribute, and that's how you have influence. Now, that journey is one which not just Microsoft has been on, every company, every enterprise and every public sector has been on, some more successfully than others, but everybody is on that. To go back to basics again, I often describe technology to people who may not have that as their core job as a pizza, right? You won't forget this. So when you look at a pizza, when you go into a pizza restaurant, what you talk about is the toppings. And if we think about technology as a pizza, the toppings are AI, ML, blockchain, the cloud, the internet. Those are the things we want to talk about, right? Those are the things we choose. But sitting underneath that pizza is a base that we rarely discuss. And for all of those technologies, that base is open source software. It is the plumbing and the plumber's tools. We describe it in the UK as the submarine under the digital economy. We're able to prove in our reporting 27% billions of pounds of contribution from open source to the UK economy. And it's often a submarine. Many of you will not know the company iSurveillant based out of Zurich. iSurveillant was recently sold to Cisco, making it an American company. 
iSurveillance has some of the most important software in the world in terms of security, um, eBPF and Cilium. And you may not know they're there. They're also part of the submarine. People sitting in your geographic area running companies that will be funded or perhaps sold to the US with people who work in companies that are often uh, US companies. And they are there floating along under your digital economy, making it work. The UK, um, this figure, 3.2 million is from January. It's nearer 3.6 million now, although I'm not publicly able to share that yet. And it's roughly 5% of the UK population making us number one in Europe, but also making us number one globally by head of population. We have more GitHub accounts than any country in the world per capita. And that's the traditional measure of open source developers. We also see France. President Macron himself is leading the charge in France on open source. And you are seeing big shifts there. And it's now the fastest growing open source economy in Europe. So the public sector. The UK back in 2012, 2011 was the first in the world to have an open source first policy. And we see that roll out through the pandemic and the COVID apps across the world. We see it in the healthcare infrastructure and the energy sector. We see the EU digital and open source strategy, which is just coming to an end. And if you're interested in understanding more about the landscape and the projects in Europe, I recommend this 2023, September 23 report from Linux Foundation. Even here in Switzerland, you're seeing uh, projects that are very successful. So why do your governments, why do your public sector want open source software? Well, I'm going to say I think it's for the wrong reason. They want it to save money. They should want it because collaborative innovation is the best. They should want it because that collaboration allows you to manage your software better. The reason they want it generally is cost saving, and that comes in two ways. It comes through removing vendor lock-in, allowing interoperability of code, and creating software that will be recycled and reused. However, problematically, in doing that, they often go back to my old definition as a lawyer, where the software has the source available and is then shared on an open source license. And what they fail to do is build a collaborative community around it, which fails to have plans for the future and to provide documentation and all the things that are needed for curation and good practices in open source. They also go back to sovereignty and sovereignty is becoming such a buzzword across the European continent. It's one that I think is quite problematic. I know it's very popular but it's very aggressive, it causes friction and breakdown. And when we look at technology, when we look at our digital futures, when we look at how opening them up has worked and is working, what we see is a need to collaborate. This little picture is the day the UK brexited. I was in Brussels with uh, a team from Open UK. We were at an open source conference collaborating with our EU neighbors. And we went to the commission uh, at midnight as we brexited and they turned the lights out. Now, I don't know if they do that every night, but it was really very, very poignant to be there and be in the dark in Brussels. And I think that helps to focus us on the changes and the shifts in society that we need to manage in our digital future, because we cannot do that in a silo. We cannot do it in isolation. And in the public sector, we know that open source creates value. We know that there's a value there, but it's very hard to measure. But it's also very hard to understand the cost. You get something that's free, but it's not really free. There is a cost, and that cost is in implementing it well and doing its curation well. It's a total cost of use, not a total cost of ownership. And it's often managed through open source program offices. We've seen one in Europe. In the UK, we don't have one, but we rely on GDS, Government Digital Services, to do that job. So the future of open source, the future of our digital economy, the future of your public sector, what are the challenges? Well, open source inevitably comes with confusion and a lack of understanding. We call it FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And fear, uncertainty, and doubt are easy because a lot of people don't understand the detail, particularly five and six, those definitions that anybody can use the code for any purpose. And when open source goes into a market, it causes disruption because it causes shift in revenue. It challenges people's traditional revenue bases. So it's very easy for them to spread FUD and to confuse users. We see problems in users not understanding what they're using, not understanding the curation of open source. And we see a journey that they go on. This is from one of our 2022 reports. They go from being consumers to being contributors to being distributors, that Microsoft journey that I talked to you about. And then we see the problem of burn. Yes, the problem of burn. 
And the problem we have here is where we look at a project that's an open source project with a headline saying that the problem with this project is open source. But in fact, the project problem is not open source. The problem here is understanding of how to procure and how to manage and how to maintain software full stop, let alone open source. Today, in an agile world, we don't use waterfall contracts that specify every detail. We use agile processes and governance, which means we fail fast. We don't fail at the end of a 21 million project. We fail in the early stages by checking in and having regular governance meetings and project management. That curation, that understanding, it applies to all software, not just open source, but you particularly have to understand an open source. And again, the FUD is spread even by open source companies problematically. We see changes in licenses for some companies. When they've taken funding, when they've IPO'd, we see them wanting to shift away from their open source model. Um, sometimes that's done in a way like this, where they've suggested they're doubling down and open here at Elastic, when actually what they're doing is moving to a restricted license, a license with commercial restrictions. We saw the same last summer with HashiCorp, one of the poster children of open source, who were sold um, two weeks ago to IBM, I think for one of the biggest tech uh, sales in history. And open source is a problem because it has maintainers, individuals who create tremendous wealth, but not for themselves. They create software that becomes our digital infrastructure, our digital critical infrastructure. And that might be the infamous single person in Nebraska who's holding up the internet but they don't receive reward. The value that they generate is billions of dollars for certain companies, but it may be that they themselves have nothing in return. And that's led to issues like uh, in the last two weeks, the XZUtil backdoor. And that was a, a situation where for the first time we've publicly seen grooming of uh, an open source maintainer. And somebody took a lot of trouble here. They spent years getting to know this maintainer of an open source project, and they made contributions to it for many years before they made a backdoor security contribution. And we see an industry response because there is governance around open source where guidelines were produced within a couple of weeks. We see security challenges, but again, a bit like the, the Baron um, software issue, these are not about open source. These security challenges are about a digital economy and how we manage that digital economy. Open source is one part of it, and we see legislation in the US, in Europe, in the UK, and we have more coming down the line with the Product Liability Directive, which is very troubling and very difficult for open source because often the regulators don't really understand the detail of what they're regulating. It's very nuanced. And AI, this is uh, through to some of the Open UK reports on it. We see challenges of copyright. We see confusion about what open source AI is. So Meta released Llama last summer, open source, except it wasn't open source. It was open innovation. It has commercial restrictions in it. And we have these debates about what open source AI means because it's not just software, it's models, it's weights, it's data. In fact, critically, and perhaps most importantly, it's data. We see a need recognized by most regulators for both open and closed AI. And we see the dangers of closed AI. We see Sam Altman being pushed out of open AI last year, and we see people leaving his company. We see customers in turmoil not knowing what to do. And of course, AI legislation coming out of Europe that is very restrictive and very difficult. And to go back to my, my point on sovereignty, we see friction from geopolitical shift. So how do we enable the future? How do we enable an open future for the public sector? We think about curation. We think about your obligations as end users to understand what you're doing. Because if you don't, who does? You need to bring into your systems processes and buy skills, whether that's through training, hiring employees, or buying services from the open source community. You need to know what you're doing when you use open source software, as you do with proprietary. We need our regulators to gain a better understanding. This little example I won't go to, into in depth, but on the uh, right-hand side as you see it, you see open versus proprietary, which is how the open source community think of it. And on the left, you see open versus closed. Now that open versus closed is how regulators tend to look at it. And our problem is this orange box, code which does not meet the open source definition, which is often part of the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, because it's described as being open. 
We need to make sure that policies about using open source are backed up by hard processes to go with that curation understanding. And lastly, we need to think about open, not just open source software, open data, all of the opens and whether they should be recharacterized as a digital public good. I know you're going to have a talk shortly about the difference or the, the need for uh, public money, public code. And I think that's absolutely critical in your thinking about where you go with open source. So with that, I'm going to leave you. I hope it's given you food for thought and set the scene on your open source conversation. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you so much, Amanda, for this great introduction and almost like a sweeping overview, I would say. I hope, um, yes, for sure, we have time for, for a couple of questions. I'm sure you have many more questions, but feel free to, I think, address you maybe uh, for a short time. Sure, it's not even 10 o'clock in the morning. That's probably overwhelmed. <laughs> exactly. Maybe you. let her have a coffee and then... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Great. Probably. So, yes, so I, I'm happy. We're happy to take a couple of questions in English, if you please. No. Terrified. Don't be shy. I know it's early in the morning, but you came all the way here, so I'm sure it's great. Yes. So from my, my knowledge of what's going on in Switzerland, I think you need to go back to basics and build across the different areas that are responsible for digital a sort of horizontal across the silos where they begin to understand both standards and open source software. And I think that that collaboration across the different verticals will help build a sense of community amongst the people who need to learn about how to manage it well so you don't repeat recent mistakes. And you need to think about your policies because I, I know you're very keen on using open source, but it's no good just to dump it on GitHub or to take something and use it without understanding it. You really need to get into some granular detail on how, not the what, but the how do you do this? How will it be managed? What benefits do you, do you want to get from it? Um, Mike Bracken, who set up GDS in the UK, keeps saying to me when I talk to him about open source, so what, Amanda? And you need to understand the so what. How do I do this and so what? What do I want to achieve from it? And keep your eye on that. And then I also think your processes need to be very agile and you need to focus on how you govern it and manage it and you stop and then you do the next phase and you stop and you check in. Any other question? You're letting me off the hook easily here. <laughs> okay. But you're not letting off easy our next speakers, because I think it will be interesting <laughs> to see how uh, the different government entities, different um, representatives that we will have here today will emulate what you've just said. Well, I hope in a year's time, maybe we'll have some processes that you can share with me to, to see if you've listened today. I Thank hope you. we will. So feel free to approach Amanda in the, in the coffee break. And so we'll move on to our next speaker again. Thank you very much.